Before you watch this video, you should try the chapter five exercises on your own. Now, as you're working through them, you may occasionally run into a problem that you don't know how to solve. If that happens to you, just skip it and continue working the rest of the problems, and then go back and see if something along the way jogged your memory. Uh, if you still can't figure them out, uh, you can actually go to Lane's book, and it has links to the sections in the book where he explains how to work those particular problems. Uh, so uh, normally work with the guide, uh, but if you need to use those links, you have to open the exercises in his online book. All right, so be sure and try all that first. It's not going to do any good if you just watch this video on how to solve the problems before trying to figure them out on your own. Normally, uh, in a normal year, we would be doing, a vi uh, doing problems like this on the board. Since I can't do that this semester, we're going to be, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to work the problems in, uh, in this video, okay? All right, so the first problems I would like to take a look at are problems number two and number nine. Now, these are, are both actually very similar to one another. So what we'll look at is nine, and I will specifically work nine B. So let's just take a look at what that question is. All right, here it is. Okay, so for nine, you have a jar that contains 20 marbles, and then some are blue, red, green, yellow, etc. cetera. Um, what we want to do is, but, uh, oh, here's an important thing. You're going to remove two marbles, right? But you don't put one back. <laughs> so uh, this is done without, or done without replacement. All right, so what is the probability that one of these marbles will be blue and the other yellow? Okay, well, let's have a look at that. All right, let's see here. Okay, first of all, notice there's like two ways we can get a successful outcome. We could get a blue marble first and then a yellow marble. Or we could get a yellow marble first and then a blue marble. Okay, so two different ways to get a successful outcome. So how about that first outcome? What's the likelihood of that? So the probability of blue and then yellow. Okay, so the first time you reach in, there are 10 of those blue marbles. There are 20 marbles total. So it's 10 out of 20, or one half basically. And then the second time you reach in there, <laughs> there's only 19 marbles left because you took one out already. And then there's only one yellow one, potentially. So one out of 19. So that's the, uh, so for, to get blue and then yellow, both of these things have to occur, which means we multiply the two probabilities together. All right. Okay, now how about getting yellow first and then blue? Well, it's almost the same thing, but you have yellow coming out first. So one out of 20 and then blue coming out second. Okay, so you're kind of twice as likely to get a success. So what we need to do is add these two things together. All right. Now, when you add them together, right? So you can sort of see in the numerator, this would be 10 times 1 divided by 20 times 19 plus... 1 times 10 divided by 20 times 19. Okay, that you can actually, or that's the same as 2 times this. So you can do some sort of rearranging here. Notice this will cancel out. You get 1 over 19. All right, and then divide by um, 1 by 19, and this is the answer you get. And that's rounded off to three decimals, which is the way we turn in problems in this class. Okay. So 5.2 is very, or question two in chapter five, is uh, very similar to this one, but this one is without replacement and 5.2 is with replacement. So what that would mean is instead of having 19 here, if this was with replacement, in other words, we took a marble out and we put it back in, you'd have 20 here and 20 there. 
I think with a 5.2, there's different numbers of cloth, for example. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, exercise 6. So recognize this problem as a binomial problem. All right, let's take a look at that one. I just want to make sure we're still recording. Okay, looks like we are here. All right, number six. Okay, so we have these uh, two girls playing a card game, and Susan wins 60% of the time. So if that's the case, that means Jessica is going to win 40% of the time. So Susan's the better player. And we're going to play nine games. What is the probability that Jessica will have won more games than Susan? Okay, so we're going to recognize this as a binomial problem because we have multiple trials. Each game is a trial. So there's n equals nine games. And we have fixed rates of success. So we have Susan winning 60% of the time. We have Jessica winning 40% of the time. Anytime you see that, multiple trials and a probability of success, you're almost certainly dealing with a binomial problem. Okay? All right, so how do we solve this one? Well, let's take a look. Now, there's two different ways to do it. You can either model Susan's losses or you can model Jessica's wins. All right? I'm going to model Jessica's wins just because I think it's a little easier to follow. All right, so we have nine games. For, for Jessica to win more, she's got to win at least five of them, right? She could win six or seven or eight. So she needs five or more. That's what she needs. Okay, and the probability of her winning is 0.4. Okay, so we use the binomial distribution to get this answer. All right. Here we have um, the nine trials, okay, and the probability of a success is 0.4 for Jessica, okay. Here's all of Jessica's possible outcomes, okay. So what we want to know is how likely is she to get five or more. So we need above four, all right. See how five is shaded? If you had put above 5 here, let's see what happens. See how 5 is not shaded anymore? This is like her winning 6, 7, or 8. So you got to be careful you put the right number in the right place. We need above 4 so that we have 5 or more is the answer. And then you recalculate. Here's the answer. 0 0.267. And we can go back. You'll see that's also what's in the guide. So the guide is correct for this problem. Okay, so the probability of Susan winning more than Susan, you know, is about 27%. Not that great, but she could do it, I suppose. All right, so let's take a look at 512. Okay, that, that one, I'll, I want to read the question first. Okay, so for this, this is that one where we have these two guys trying to play baseball, I guess. All right. So Tommy seems to be a little bit better player than Joey. He, he's going to get a hit 30% of the time. Now that's going to mean that he's going to miss the ball 70% of the time, right? Either he's going to hit or he's going to miss it. Joey, on the other hand, only gets a hit 25% of the time. All right. So I want to look at this first question here. What is the probability that Joey or Tommy but not both, and that's the key thing here, we'll get a hit. Now, here's the formula Lane put in here. This is that formula where you have like probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus probability of B minus the probability of A and B. That's what this formula is. You cannot use this formula to work this problem. Because to use this formula, this, but not both, couldn't be here. <laughs> so if this is said, probability that Joey or Tommy or both will get a hit, then you can use that formula. Uh, but for this particular one, you can't use that formula. So what do we do? 
Well, just like with problems, uh, you know, number two and number nine, you should look at this as there's two ways that we could get a success, right? Either Joey could get a hit and Tommy couldn't, or Tommy could get a hit and Joey couldn't, right? Those are the only two things that would be a successful outcome. Okay. So here we go. All right. Thus, there's only two, there are two ways to get a success. Tommy hits and Joey doesn't, or Joey hits and Tommy doesn't. So we're going to find out what these are and we're going to add them together. So probability of Tommy getting a hit and Joey doesn't. Tommy, a little bit better, gets a hit 30% of the time, but Joey can't. So you got to multiply those two things together. And then Joey gets a hit, Tommy doesn't. Same thing, got to multiply those two things together. Now all you got to do, find out what those are and add them, and that will give you the answer. So I usually keep a little calculator handy so I can do these things. Let me just show you what I usually do. I always have this open when I'm working problems because it's just easier for me. All right, so we, what we want here is we're going to have Tommy hitting it, right? And Joey not, okay, 75% chance of Joey not hitting it. And we're going to add that to um, Joey hitting it, 0.25, and Tommy not hitting it. Okay, and notice the answer to this is 0 0.400 if you round it off to four decimals. Okay, so that would be the correct answer, not the 0.475 like Lane has. Okay, let's look at another question here. Number 19. All right, let's look at this one. So this one, the guide is wrong again. <laughs> so let's see what we have here. For this one, we're going to roll a dice, or a die, I guess. And uh, so five sides of the die are painted black. And one side is painted white. And it's going to be rolled six times. There's one of those repeated trials. You should already be thinking, well, I bet this is a binomial problem because we got repeated trials. Which of the following is more likely? So, so it's the, both of them are black sides up. So those are successes. Now there's five of those. So that's five out of six. That's a fixed rate of success. We've got repeated trials, fixed rate of success. Okay, that's the wrong answer. <laughs> All right, so I think when the author was writing this, maybe he was trying to do a gambler's dilemma problem. I'm not really sure, but that's, this is the wrong answer. Okay. So I suspect it's a gambler's dilemma problem. What we have, though, is a binomial problem. We have a fixed number of trials in, and we have a fixed rate of success. Five out of six for black. All right, so this is a binomial problem. Let's use the binomial calculator. All right, what we're going to do, we're going to model how many times the black sides come up. All right, so there's six trials. All right. The black sides are going to come up with 5 divided by 6, 0. 0.8333. Okay. Now don't put 0. 0.8 because then it won't, everything won't fit. See? Don't do this. We, we can get more decimals if we just put 0. 0.833. And that's what you got to do. All right? Because we don't want rounding errors. Okay, so here are the times the black sides come up. Notice you're more likely to get five black sides. How likely? Well, we can find out. Okay. To get five black slide, sides and only one, you know, and one white side coming up. All right. You have about a 40% chance of that happening. Okay. What about getting black on every roll? Well, black on every roll, there's only a 33% chance of that happening. So, going back to the guide, we see that the correct answer is A. Black side up on five of the rolls, white side up on the other roll. Now, 
This might be different. Well, it would be different if this said black side up on the first five of the rolls, but it doesn't say that. It just says five of the six, they're black, and one of the six is white. Okay, so the correct answer is A for 19. All right, what next? Okay, I want to look at number eight because eight is a Bayes problem. So let's read eight. People love the Bayes problems. Okay, so what do we have here? So we have a test correctly identifies a disease and 95% of the people who, let's see, is that going to make it easier to see? Yeah. A test correctly identifies a disease in 95% of people who have it. Okay. It correctly identifies no disease in 94% of the people who don't. Okay. And in the population, 3% of the people have the disease. So this 3%, this is what people usually call a prior probability. So that's kind of like what we know before the test is produced. Now we've got this test. This is new stuff. So how does it affect our predictions of whether somebody has a disease if they get a positive test because that's what this is asking for. Now let's see what these other probabilities are. So here we have a test that is correct if you actually have the disease. So this is a true positive and then we have a test that is correct and when you don't have the disease that's a true negative. Okay. All right, so let's see. We can make a little table that shows this kind of stuff. So focus on the top table. That's what is given to us. So the problem tells us, first of all, I put, you know, the prior probability. I'll, I usually put this in the top here as the column headings. So we have the people who have the disease, 3% of them have it. People who don't have the disease, 97% don't have it. That has to, those have to add to 100%. All right. Now, the test can either be positive or negative, right? So in this small group of people, they get a positive test 95% uh, of the time. In this big gr group of people, they get a negative test 94% of the time. That's what, that's what the problem gives us. Notice these two cells are empty in the table, but we can find them. And this should be easy because if you're in this group, and you take the test, the test can either be positive or negative. So whatever's here, that has to add up to 1. So that's going to be 0 0.05. Same thing over here. If you take a test and you're in this group, it's either positive or negative. So that's going to be 0 0.06. Okay, so now that we've got a complete table, it's a lot easier to solve this problem. So this is what we know for sure. So we know that somebody took, took the test and the test is positive. What does that mean? That means they're in this top row here. Either they are one of these rare people, you know, this small group. They could be a member of the small group and they could have the positive test. Or they could be a member of this big group and they could have the positive test. You see what I mean? So what we want to know is, how likely are they this type of person? Well, it, in other words, it's like that out of all possible outcomes. It's just like if you roll the dice and you want to know how likely is it that the one is going to come up. In other words, how likely is the one going to come up? It's the probability of that out of all of this. Because all we know is they're in one of these two groups. All we know is they're positive. So you have the successful outcome, and it doesn't sound like a success, you know, but it is. <laughs> they have the disease and they're positive, you know, divided by all possible outcomes. Okay, so to be in this group, two things have to happen. You have to have it and you have to be positive. So we're going to multiply those two things together. Uh, to be in this group, same kind of thing. All right. Now to be... So the ratio of that, so we'd have the, the success, 95% uh, times 3%, uh, basically. Those two people. And then you want to divide 
all, all possible outcomes. So that's the sum of these two things. So here's the first category, this, having it and being positive. And here's the second category, not having it and being positive. And that, if, if you plug that into the calculator, you're going to get the correct answer, I believe. This is also the formula you see here in the guide. Okay. All right. So let's see. The last thing I want to take a look at is the shark data. All right. So for the shark data, I've already downloaded this into a spreadsheet. And I was sort of playing around with some of this before. I'm going to go ahead and delete this and I'm going to just redo all this. All right. Let me just delete that row as well. Okay. What we're going to do with this data, so this happened, you know, back in 2018. There was, uh, there were 66 shark attacks. And the media, you know, thinking they knew what they were doing, kind of look at that and they're like, wow, that doesn't sound like very many. Usually it's like 80 people getting attacked by sharks. So, goodness, what's going on? Is this pollution killing the sharks? Maybe people are overfishing. They drew all these conclusions based on a single data point. And I think this was a, a mistake. So we can figure out, well, how likely is it that you would get 66 shark attacks? All right, so what I did is I went online and I found the counts for the last few years. I went all the way back to 2009. And as you can see, yeah, most years it is about 80, but some years it's really high, 98. <laughs> and some years it's really low, 64. So let's just ignore the 66 for a minute and let's average the other years. So notice I have these in cells, looks like B4 all the way down to B12. Okay, so let's get an average rate of success. All right. B4, oh wait, you gotta put average, equals average B4 to B12. Okay, notice how it shades everything there. All right, there we go. Average rate of success, 79.33. Okay, now the next thing we're going to need is the Poisson calculator. Let me see if I still have it open. I do here. All right, so I was actually doing this a while ago. All right, so what you would do to do the Poisson calculator is we, we don't want a rounding error, so we're just going to hold the control key down and hit C for copy. And then we go back to the Poisson calculator and we hit hold the control key down and hit V to enter. All right, so let's put 66 up here first of all. Let's see what that is. Okay, so well, the probability, given that average rate of success, the probability of getting exactly 66 shark attacks is only about 1%, but we really shouldn't be looking at that, right? Because what you got to do is, the way the media is interpreting this, they're looking at 66 and they're saying, something has changed in the population, and we know that because this value is extreme. So it's an extreme value. Okay, yeah, it's lower than average, but is it low enough? I mean, that's really the question we should be asking. What we should be asking here is, how likely are we to see extreme values like this? Okay, so actually, let's go back and look at that spreadsheet again, all right? So we have this extreme value of 66. How extreme is that? Well, let's see here. Um, B13 minus 66. Okay, so that's off by about 13 shark attacks. So that's 13 fewer attacks than normal. Now, if that's an extreme value, and nothing has really changed in the population, then occasionally that should also, you know, happen 
in response to, you know, you should get high values that are like that extreme, but at the other end. So let's see here. Um, B13. Okay. So occasionally we should be getting like 93. This one I'm just going to round off. 93. Okay. There we go. All right. So let me, let's talk about this one more time. So what we've got here is, and this is what the Poisson distribution is. It is a model of how often sharks, shark attacks occur if they occur at random, given, you know, how frequently these sharks are around. So on average, you've got about 79 shark attacks per year. Okay. Now, just by chance, Sometimes you're going to get high values and low values. So what we want to know is, has the population changed? To do that, we need to know if the low or high values we're seeing are extreme enough to say that the population has changed. So we want to know how likely both high values and equally low values are. So this is, you know, I, I showed some scenarios like this in the videos we were looking at, all right? So first of all, we've already found out how likely the low values are. What we need to be looking at then are values of 66 or fewer, okay? How likely are those? That's this value right here. See, it's x less than or equal to 66, okay? So this is the probability of values 66 or fewer. Now I'm going to take that probability and put it into my spreadsheet here. All right. Now what I want to know is how about extreme values on the other end? How likely are those? So they are 93 or more. So let's see what that would be. Okay. So that would be 93 or more. It's almost the same. What that tells me is this particular Poisson distribution is more or less symmetrical. Okay, so you want to know what these are? <laughs> All right, well, it's the sum of the two is how likely it is to get these. 13... E14. Okay, 14%. All right, so this is how I would report this. All right, let's see here. Where is my PowerPoint? Here it is. Looks like I closed it already. Okay, here we go. It's actually supposed to be 14%. All right. The way I would say this, um, although 66 appears to be a low number of shark attacks, just by random chance, a value this extreme, because you got to remember, we got to look at both ends if it's just we're looking at how likely these extreme values are going to occur, uh, could occur about 14% of the time. And that's just by chance. You know, so thus there is really no compelling evidence to say that the rate of shark attacks has changed. So I think the media completely got it wrong. They misinterpreted this data. Yeah, it's a low score, but that kind of thing is going to happen whether or not anything has happened to the shark population about 14% of the time. Okay. Now, if this number over here had been really low, like if this was like 5% or lower, then I think they would be okay. If that was the case, then they could say, yeah, sure, something's happened to the sharks. All right. Now, another question I ask about the shark data is, is it aggregated or clumped or something like that? So let's see if that's the case. All right. For this, we're actually going to use all the data. So we'll use the data from 2018 all the way down to 2009. All right, so we're actually going to need an average, and we're going to need a variance, because what we need is a coefficient of dispersion to answer this question. 
Okay, so there, B3 to B12. Okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to make this larger so you guys can see it, but let's see. I wanted to, hold on, whoops, that's not going to work. Okay, uh, I wanted to, to show you, whoops, that's not going to work either. Well, anyway, I won't, won't do that, but <laughs> normally when you're entering formulas, everything gets highlighted, and so if you don't have your spreadsheet enlarged like I do, you usually can read this. Okay, now what we need is a coefficient of dis dispersion for this. I'm just going to abbreviate it. Um, that is equal to the variance divided by the average. So B14 over B13. Okay. All right, notice it's really close to 1. What that tells us is that the shark attacks are almost certainly random. If this had been a really, really big number, like 4, <laughs> then it would be reasonable to assume that the shark attacks are, you know, clumped. But that's not the case here. That's a pretty low coefficient of dispersion. Remember, it's still a descriptive statistic, so we don't want to be really strong in stating this, but, you know, based on the data from 2009 to 2018, uh, shark attacks appear to be random, and then you can put that coefficient of dispersion in there. All right, and with that, I will end this video.